All right, if we can look at this, we don't have it flat at all. And I have ordered another hoop so I can put it in a hoop and hopefully do it better. So I'm not going to put up any more videos until I get that other hoop, which comes in on December the 12th. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take old parts where I've done this and I'm going to put it up so you can go ahead and hear the rest of the video down below. Alrighty, here we go. Here's your diagram. These are your uh, drawings. Artificial fell. Here's the avocado root there. Here's the dead root over there. Distance 120 or 21 inches below and 14 inches below the footing. Um, there's the avocado root there, live avocado root. And these are all diagrams by the archaeologists. Good documentation. They're the roots themselves. That shows you the size, two, two centimeters. Next. There's the plastic Disney bag. Turn it over. There's the plastic Disney bag. Disney classroom 82, 83. Sandwich bag. It was a sandwich bag. Um, this is shows the arch of the tunnel. Now, the school was built in 1966, which means the foundation were laid, was laid then. And here's your arch. And this is the from classroom four here into classroom three over here. And it was 12 inches higher over to the left. Go ahead. There's yours truly looking up. Uh, this was in classroom four, as I recall. And this is where the tunnel extended, right along here. Now, the reason the tunnel's been filled in, you have to understand that. And the reason the archaeologists could say that they were filled in is because the texture of the dirt that had been filled in was different than the natural texture. Okay. Just turn it off for me. In addition to the tunnels, I developed information that an abandoned satanic site was in Crestline, California. Crestline, California is in the mountains. The kids said, remember a few minutes ago, they were flown by jet, or flown, I didn't say jet, into the mountains. There's an airport 10 minutes from the McMartin Preschool. It's Hawthorne Airport. There's a landing strip in Crestline. I heard about this abandoned satanic site, and I went up to the site, took pictures. And this is what I, and by the way, before I go on with this, I call the prosecutor in the McMartin case. And I told her, hey, I think I know where the children were taken. If they weren't, it's certainly worth looking at. And I will be glad to make this information available to you. And if you want to have the children go up and look at this abandoned satanic site, we can. She said, we're not interested. They weren't interested in hardcore evidence, the tunnel. They weren't interested in this abandoned satanic site. Go ahead. This is what we found, 666, one of the satanic signs, that's a stone on the site. The house was uh, had been up here. The day after the McMartin case broke in the news, the house burned to the ground. And, uh, and it was here, the streets on the other side of the hill. You cannot see the site, this area down in here, from the street. You have to go in, would have had to go in through the house and come down. And this, you can see it's quite elaborate. There's my associate, Judy Hansen, who works with me in LA. And uh, next. This is uh, looking at the opposite direction of the picture we just took. And you can see there's San Bernardino down in there. And uh, you can see that uh, on the side of a mountain like that, nobody's going to find it unless you fly over with a helicopter. That's probably an altar, flattened stone. Uh, also an altar, another altar that had been broken. Uh, this is, uh, of course, you recognize the star. Now, this is a satanic symbol. 
Put the next one in. Hold the first one. There it is right there. Put the other first one back on. Now overlay them. Turn it around that way. Okay, any question about that, folks? No. Well, let's read what that says. Anne's Day. Asthma, asthma Day. A strong and powerful king appears with three heads, the first like a bull, the second like a man, the third like a ram. He has a serpent's tail, the web feet of a goose, and he vomits fire. He rides the infernal dragon, carries lance and pennon, and is the chief of the power of Ammon. He must be invoked, be bareheaded, or otherwise he will deceive. He gives the ring of virtues, teaches arithmetic, uh, geometry, and other handicrafts, answers all questions, makes men invisible, indicates the place of concealed treasures, and guards them if within the domain of the Ammon. Oh, what do we got here? Another satanic symbol. You think that wasn't a satanic side? Overlay it. Okay. Is that it? The other way around, isn't it? Yeah. Flip it around. Okay, there you go. Okay, now let's read what that one, what that uh, sign means. That is the seal of Adamson scale. I, I guess I have. No, that's the wrong that's the one before. Belial, a mighty king created next after Lucifer, appears in the form of a beautiful <coughs> angel seated in a chariot of fire and speaking with a pleasant voice. He fell first amongst the spirit angels who went before Michael and other heavenly angels. He distributes pre uh, uh, pre preferences of senatorships, causes favors of friends and foes, and gives excellent families. Familiar? He must have offering and sacrifices made to him. Next. And there's another satanic sign. I couldn't make that one out, so I couldn't match it with anything, obviously. Here's some ovens. That was a large, large circle with a number of signs in it, a lot of writing. Uh, we couldn't get up high enough that we could uh, take a good picture of it. And let's put that, put that back a minute. That's another case. Okay, um, nothing came of that. Uh, nobody was interested in an abandoned satanic site, even though it appears to have been related to the McMartin case. Um, I have to say that uh, I was very disappointed. We gather this evidence privately. The police don't have the capability of doing so. Too many high-pressure people involved. Too many prominent individuals involved. Uh, so that's just in this. Uh, uh, that's just an overview of the McMartin case, folks. Uh, no question in my mind uh, that uh, it was uh, a satanic operation. And Dr. Roland Summit, uh, UCLA psychiatrist, says we've done a lot of research in this field also that there are 50 other preschools in the country where the kids have talked about going down into tunnels. Now. This is another case that I worked out of Philadelphia, similar case to Linda's. And this is the Lou Bear case. Lou called me back in, I guess, the late 80s. And uh, he said that uh, he had uh, gone underground with his children. The, the great FBI came in with their SWAT team, as they did with Linda, raided his house, grabbed him, put him in jail, took the children, turned them over to his ex-wife, whose boyfriend, according to the children, was sexually molesting them. And uh, Luce said, what can I do and how can you help me? So I was willing to go back and testify for Lou. And uh, one of the uh, matters that I was going to testify about was the drawings by the kids. And it's a, not a funny thing, but it's an established fact that children who have sec been sexually molested, for some reason or other, when they're, you know, two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten years old, whatever, will invariably draw pictures of their activity, of this activity, of their exposure to these nefarious uh, matters. Invariably they do that. Now when I was that age, I was drawing cars and airplanes, and the girls were drawing flowers, right? But these kids invariably will draw these pictures. As you can see from Linda's case, she has pictures at her booth that her children have drawn. Now this was a, I was gonna go back and testify for Lou, and I was going to say that based upon 
my reviewing the pictures drawn by the children, they've been exposed to a satanic activity. This is the most telltale of all the pictures. You're gonna, I'm going to show you a series of them. This is a totem pole with a goat's head at the top, children at the very highest level. I understand, again, I'm, I, I say I understand because I'm not sure because there's so much secrecy involved in the satanic movement. Eight, ten layers of classes of people within themselves, like the dabblers on up to the very highest level. But from my sources and my informants, I've been told that the very highest level of Satanism, you will have the totem pole, which is usually three to six feet tall, made out of wood, with a goat head at the top. So I was going to testify that based on my experience, that these children were exposed to the highest level of Satanism, because, mainly because of this drawing right here, the goat hole, the, the totem pole with the goat's head. The judge would not allow me on the witness stand. I flew all the way to Philadelphia from Los Angeles, wouldn't allow me to testify. These are some of the other drawings. Uh, this is a, a body on a, on a slab, on, undoubtedly an altar where they sacrifice in blood. The genitals, and let me mention this also, children who have never been sexually molested in a recent study, not a recent study, a study back about seven or eight years ago, Children who have never been sexually molested do not draw the genitals. Children who have been sexually molested, a high percentage of them draw the genitals. And so children who have been ritualistically sexually molested, a high, higher percentage will draw the, the, the uh, genitals. Uh, little Matt Bear drew a picture of people, a fire, a baby being thrown in the fire, human sacrifice, obviously. An altar, bone, liver, blood, kitty. And another uh, ritual of ceremony. Here's trees, people, fire. And another, people have no cloth on, he says. Table, knife, devil. Okay, that's the Lou Bear case. Now, I think we're going to just, we, we got just a few more minutes, and I want Linda to take the podium, talk about her case. But I'm going to run through these next slides real fast, Linda. 100,000 children disappear every year per Reader's, per Reader's Digest, July 1982. Next. This is the official U.S. Customs Report that establishes the great CIA under the name Finders, a covert operation is involved in the international trafficking of children. It's about nine or ten pages long. We'll just flip through the pages. If you want to take a look at this report, go to my table and take a look at it. And if you want, please buy it. It's ten dollars. Make copies. Get it out to your friends. Okay, keep going. Just do it real quick. Keep, again, keep going. Go to the last page. Just, just flip them and then just go to the last page. That's how long it is. Keep going. And some more. That's it. That's it. Okay. The way this case came about is uh, a group of children were seen in a park in Tallahassee, Florida in 1987. The um, police were called. The men were well-dressed. They had a van. Police came out, talked to the kids. The kids said that they were en route to Mexico to a smart school. And the police traced that van back up to the Finders in Washington, D.C. They raided the Metropolitan Police Department, raided the Finders headquarters and also a warehouse. And they found all this paraphernalia. They found information about international trafficking of kids all over the world. The Finder, based on my research subsequent to that, again, CIA covert operation. The customs agent was called into it because of the possibility of pornography, and I guarantee that there was pornography involved. Guarantee, okay? Now, this report, this was his report. Again, this is available, Missing Children, $10 in my booth. This report is the final interview by the customs agent when he attempted to go over and get more information than he'd already developed. Okay, let's just go over this. Leave it there, leave it there. Leave it there. Okay. April 2, I arrived at the Metropolitan Police Department at approximately 9 a.m. Detective Bradley was not available. He was the detective who was supposed to help him. 
I spoke to a third party who was willing to discuss the case with me on a strictly off-the-record basis. I would advise that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State they found um, they found uh, passports in the van. The uh, State Department, in turn, advised the Metropolitan Police that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam during the late 50s and mid-70s. Folks, it was illegal to travel there, travel there to those countries during that period. The individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police report had been classified secret and was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's FBI headquarters, by the way, had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington field office, that's the field office, of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. No action will be taken. The case was closed, and here we have a CIA internal matter. The finders... Group, the finder's case organization was founded by a CIA agent back in the early 60s, and here we are, 1987, still operating. I have the man's name. I have all the information on it. A real quick overview, CIA experiments with mind control on children, MK Ultra. This is an outstanding article. It's, again, it's available in that same report. Just flip, flip the pages. Keep going. Okay. Folks, I'm going to turn the podium over to Linda Wiegand. We have about another 15, 20 minutes, I believe. And Linda's going to talk about her case. This is one of the most classic examples of corruption I have ever seen. And believe me, you can tell from my lecture that I've seen some pretty awful examples of corruption. Go on for a minute. Linda Wiegand, my friend, God bless her, she's a fighter. Thanks. I'm here to tell you I'm a living, breathing example of what happens when a satanic cult abuses your children. And sometimes I put slides above the abuse, but um, um, after seeing the slides of the children this morning, I think you understand what this is about. And there's pictures over at the booth right out here. The devil to me, maybe 10 years ago, was something that was... Uh, Oh, I went to Catholic church. I'm still Catholic and Christian. I went to church, and the devil was something out there that you didn't want to talk about at night, and, you know, you didn't talk about in the dark, and it was just something in science fiction movies. My children disclosed just sexual abuse in early 1993. They were masturbating. They were pulling their pants down at the uh, supermarket. They started having oral sex with my St. Bernard. Inserting, uh, inserting pens and pencils into the dog's rectum. The behavior got worse and worse and worse. I woke up one morning. I don't usually talk about this stuff. I woke up one morning to the bread, um, you know, the butcher block that you cut bread on, because I'm a vegetarian, so it wasn't a butcher block. And there was a huge bread knife in the middle of the butcher block with a big pool of ketchup in the middle of it. And that was on my kitchen table. And I said to my children, what is this? Who did this? What, what does this mean? And my son John said, Mom, this is some of the things that we have to see and that have been done to us. I knew I had a big, big problem, and I had no idea what it was called. I called all over the country. I had children's drawings for the police. My husband was under arrest for sodomy and oral sex with my children. And I had all kinds of drawings that had circles and people with, uh, there was black candles always in the middle of these tables and, and all this uh, oral and anal sex pictures. And I went to the Catholic Church and I said, I don't know what this is, but it seems to me these, these drawings are significant. There are all kinds of symbols I don't understand and, and uh, devil heads and, and goat's heads. And I had no idea what, I did not know what satanic ritual abuse was. <coughs> church asked me if I ever had a psychiatric exam and um, I said actually I'm completely sane I just know that there's symbols in these pictures no one would help me 
even though there was a prosecution going on, they said if you ever bring up satanic ritual abuse, your credibility is lost and you'll just be a kook and it doesn't exist and it's not organized in America. Just focus on child sexual abuse. So I took my children to a child sexual abuse hospital. And while they were being treated, and I had legal custody of my children, and my husband and his lawyers and the judge found out my children were in a, an expert hospital, they confiscated my house, everything I've ever owned, from my baby pictures to my clothes. I walked away with literally the clothes we had on our backs, took my cars, my federal post office box mail, my income, my assets. I lost everything by taking my children to an expert on child abuse. It was trying to stop me from what my children could disclose from being uncovered to try and just break so that we had no assets to have my children have medical attention. The children being treated for sexual abuse and I had provided all the documentation and one day the doctor said to me, I need you to come into my office. She said, this is a classic case of SRA. I had no idea. I mean, SRA, is that like an Irish uh, Republican Army thing? I don't know what SRA is. She said, satanic ritual abuse. And she showed me the drawings that the children were doing her office. And they were of blood sacrifice, of people cutting their arms and dripping blood in chalices, of chalices with devil heads, and on and on and on. It includes group sex. It includes children being killed. And I remember I just felt like my guts were just punched out of my body. I did not know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I called every organization in the country asking for help, children's organizations. And no one wants to acknowledge satanic ritual abuse. And all the child abuse organizations only say that they lobby. They don't actually help people. And so my quest to save my children has taken me here. And as a consequence, and I can tell you here today, there are other mothers who are here today to ask me for help who have children that were victims of satanic ritual abuse. And it's really hard for me because I'm only one person and my life has been annihilated, although I, I have to say it's being rebuilt for the better. But John and Ben, my boys, are 11 and 8 and have lived for 15 or 16 months in the home of a satanic abuser who has been documented as a member of a cult, who 25 people in the state's attorney in Connecticut are investigating and have substantiated sexual abuse and the cult, and yet the governor and no one has been acting to protect my children. So it makes me wonder just how high this goes. But I'll tell you a story about a little boy that affected my life, and I guess it's besides John and Ben, who I always think about and who I want to stop this from ever happening to another child again. I heard a story about a little eight-year-old boy, and his mom had taken him to protect him, and they were found, and I had been underground for three years, by the way. The mother and this little boy were found. The little boy was taken to a basement, he was crucified alive. First he was skinned. When they torture the children, it causes a physical reaction of the endomorphins in your body to just increase because of the terror and the pain. So when the Satanists drink the blood, they actually get like a chemical, re you know, a high, like a drug high from the blood of a tortured victim. And this little boy was found in the basement dead with no blood, skinned alive and crucified. This cannot happen to any more children. I can't do it alone. My children are there. It's really hard. I need each one of you to know this is not a fairy tale. This is not something out of science fiction. I was a mom who ran a charity and baked oatmeal cookies for my kids. And because my children are victims, I have to stand here. And I have to tell you these horrible stories, and I could tell them all day and all night, because both Ted and I get letters and calls for people begging for help all over the country right now. And the only way we can help them is to help save John and Ben first, set the precedence. We will not tolerate this anymore, not only to the children, but to our own lives. And we will not tolerate this. We must stand together. And I ask you to please 
especially prayer and donations and letters and help me save John and Ben and then the rest of us are forming a task force to go around the country and start saving everybody else. Thank you very much.